1 Samuel chapter 19 Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, If you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, He is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, Bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed, and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, Why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told him, He said to me, Let me get away. Why should I kill you? When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naoth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying, with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men, and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Sikhu, and he asked, Where are Samuel and David? Over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah, but the Spirit of God came even on him. And he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments, and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay naked all that day and all that night. That is why people say, Is Saul also among the prophets? One Samuel chapter twenty. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah, and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied. You're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why should he hide this from me? It isn't so. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. So David said, Look, tomorrow is the new moon feast, and I am supposed to dine with the king. 
but let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says, Very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he is determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, Jonathan said. If I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, Who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let's go out into the field. So they went there together. Then Jonathan said to David, I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, that I will surely sound out my father by this time the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed towards you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. May the Lord be with you, as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon feast. You will be missed, because your seat will be empty. The day after tomorrow, towards evening, go to the place where you hid when this trouble began, and wait by the stone easel. I will shoot three arrows to the side of it, as though I were shooting at a target. Then I will send a boy, and say, Go find the arrows. If I say to him, Look, the arrows are on this side of you, bring them here. Then come, because as surely as the Lord lives, you are safe, there is no danger. But if I say to the boy, Look, the arrows are beyond you. Then you must go, because the Lord has sent you away. And about the matter you and I discussed, remember, the Lord is witness between you and me forever. So David hid in the field. And when the new moon feast came, the king sat down to eat. He sat in his customary place by the wall, opposite Jonathan, and Abner sat next to Saul, but David's place was empty. Saul said nothing that day, for he thought something must have happened to David to make him ceremonially unclean. Surely he is unclean. But the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. Then Saul said to his son Jonathan, Why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, Let me go because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town, and my brother has ordered me to be there. If I have found favor in your eyes, let me go to see my brothers. That is why he has not come to the king's table. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman! Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame, and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. On that second day of the feast he did not eat, because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. In the morning, 
Jonathan went out to the field for his meeting with David. He had a small boy with him, and he said to the boy, Run and find the arrows I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out after him, Isn't the arrow beyond you? Then he shouted, Hurry, go quickly, don't stop. The boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master. The boy knew nothing about all this, only Jonathan and David knew. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said, Go, carry them back to town. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together. But David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants for ever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to the town. One Samuel chapter twenty one. David went to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king sent me on a mission and said to me, No one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what have you to hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread to hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed women have been kept from us, as usual whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, Don't you have a spear or sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon, because the king's mission was urgent. The priest replied, The sword of Goliath the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Eli is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands? David took these words to heart, and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he feigned insanity in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, Look at the man, he's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? John chapter 4 Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. 
The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, It's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps, draws a wage, and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. 
When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay ill at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee.